Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in. And welcome to you from all parts of the world. If you can see and hear me clearly, just put a hi in the chat box. Just want to ensure you all have a seamless experience. Okay, am I audible? Yes, no, hi in the chat box. Okay, great. Th thanks, thanks, Shane. Th thanks, Sanmay. And uh, with us today, we have a very, very special guest, uh, Genevieve, who's here all the way to, from, from the UK to teach you about the industrialization of blockchain. Thanks so much, Genevieve, for taking time out. Uh, before I move on to introduce Genevieve, I just want to introduce two, two rules for this session and two very basic rules. If you have any issues with respect to uh, the audio, video, or Genevieve has some in-between questions for some of you, please use the chat box. But if you want Genevieve to take questions after her session gets over, we have uh, an AMA and a Q&A round, if you want to call it that way. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. So two very basic rules, and uh, I will now while introducing Genevieve, also launch uh, the poll to understand a little bit more about you and what your expectations are from today's session. We are in session two of the blockchain series of Insights with Upgrad and uh, about today's speaker, the fabulous speaker from Haiti has earned reputation for the delivery of disruptive technologies and large scale projects and is also recognized as an authority in the realm of digital identity and financial transformation. Genevieve is adept in leading or participating in cross-functional teams on a global basis. With 25 years of experience, she deals with large corporations and banks in financial supply chain optimization and has also been recognized on the Women in 2016-17 FinTech Power List, Innovate Finance, testifies to her resilience and leadership. Thank you so much, Genevieve, for making time out today for us and uh, for enlightening our audience with today's session. I would, are you able to see the live results of the poll which is in progress? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, thank you. I'm sort of looking at it so I can make sure I shape my conversation. It looks like we're even in terms of industry shaping and also career. Uh, so we'll give it, we'll wait till the poll runs out. And um, so for all of you, uh, I'm really happy to be joining you today. Uh, I see someone has raised their hand. Um, if you have any question, please put it in the Q&A as Meda said, uh, and I will be looking to start as soon as the poll is over. And um, while the poll is continuing, I actually will go to the, my next slide, which is, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about me. So while we're finding a little bit about more about you. So I would be in the 15 plus years, as it says, and also uh, very interested in all the outcomes because I have actually look, been looking at how this is shaping the industry. Uh, I am part of the industry and also uh, I'm very much uh, be one of the people who has transitioned my career into this space and would be very happy to tell you more about it. So about me, um, as Meta said, I'm Genevieve Lavelle. She pronounces the English way, I pronounce it the French way. Uh, I was born in Haiti. Um, I, the, you know, I'm an immigrant and also an island girl. I m migrated from Haiti to the island of Manhattan. And then about 10 years ago in September, I moved over to the UK and was very unhappy in London until I landed in Jersey. So if you guys have never heard of Jersey, this is where everything began from the history of the world to the history of the finance, uh, which is in terms of um, really looking at how you are, uh, you know, the, this old idea of how do you do taxation better? Because Jersey 
gain its independence uh, from a fiscal independence from the UK, but it's part of the UK. So that's why we have a lot of asset management firms. So as it says, uh, I spent many years with GE, RBS, and also Hewlett Packard. So that also led me to spend quite a bit of time in India, because as you know, all three companies have very big uh, operations. And I really had a lot of, you know, I shared with Meta, I even have plenty of Saris. And it's not only India, I think I'm a global person. I've gone to practically everywhere. I think New Zealand is one of the places I haven't made it yet to, and I haven't made it to the Falcon Islands, but it's on the bucket list if we can ever get away from COVID. So uh, thank you so much to everybody for the poll. So today, really, what I'm going to be taking you through is this whole concept of money, because money, as we know, is what the ma makes the world go round, which has led us to this idea of cryptocurrency. And what's coming now is this central bank digital currency. Everyone is, you know, there's the e krona the e uh, i think the brits is the new one from the brits there's even talk of a e euro and an e dollar so um i'm going to quickly walk us through and also take us through this journey and tell you a bit more about what's going on and what we're seeing and what the future holds so what makes it that's a you know that's question that we really have um, big, big ideas about. And if we look at places like uh, in the Pacific, there is this idea of these huge um, boulders, which are money. So that actually comes in about durability. What we have now is also portability. So I guess that rock is not really portable, but is valuable. And it is this, uh, we have gone from rocks to gold to now we have units. And one of the big things about money is making sure that there's a limited supply and so that it can retain the value on demand. That is also why we have a lot of regulatory aspect. We have central bank and the central bank's role is usually protecting the value of money and making sure that the inflation and deflationary aspects are not there. And really, basically, it's this intrinsic value that we have in money, and it becomes on how we want to use it. So we, you know, people have tried barter, but at the end of the day, we come up with all these different currency. And that is where we have now also see this idea of cryptocurrency. So we now, when we look at cash, we would suggest that this has been a way of keeping um, borders. Now borders, as we know, uh, you know I, I, would, I would suggest that today we are being really with COVID and the pandemic, having a restarting of what I would have suggested um, President Trump was trying to do was to put walls around the US and now everywhere is locked down. So therefore we really have sovereign nations and people are not able to go or it's very difficult. So one of the solution that was found after let's say, I think this started in, in Europe was to have this idea of printing money which then could be easily used and also sealed by to create trust. And in the US and also now in everywhere, you will have unique IDs, which ensures the, that it is unique and also that it cannot be replicated. Now, as we know, that's anything which has value, people try to replicate. And that's why we have a lot of people trying to print out US dollars. And, as, as a result, more and more, you will have um, certain items which are hidden in there. And this is not just a dollar, this is a euro. And the, the governments are really fighting against this all the time. And so what we have to uh, look at is how do make, we make it accessible, how we make it portable, but also 
what we as individual want is how to make this money untraceable because we don't, I don't really want everybody to know where I'm paying and how I'm paying. But if we look at what has happened in terms of digital, we have now moved to an environment where everything we do is online and there is a record. So I hope you, that gives you an idea of the progression that we're doing in terms of that. So the, for me, I like that my money is not, is not traceable, but obviously the government doesn't want that because it does allow for fraud. It allows for money laundering. And also it can be very difficult to distribute. So if you have ATM, um, which I believe came in in the early 70s. Uh, now you can go and get cash without having to go into a bank. But if you are looking at a very remote area, how do you get cash over to those people? And how do they actually um, transact? Which another challenge with this is that if you have it where someone is not protected, is there going to be a case for theft? So. Those are really some of the shortfalls that we see in uh, physical money. So one of the items that is coming in with blockchain is what is in terms of digital currency. But what's missing is this double spending or what we can be called as immutability, which is it doesn't change over time and it cannot be changed. So which means that um, the ability of someone to say, I didn't do this or I did it is much more limited. So this is where it takes us into the blockchain. So digital money and one of the things that it, we're talking a lot about these days is digitization of money. Some of these projects in, in terms of CBDC, there are over 180 of them glo globally happening. About four or five are semi-live. Uh, the biggest live one is actually in China. And this morning I was reading actually an article that some uh, senators in the US are demanding that the athletes who are in Japan, American athletes be uh, be barred if they use the um, e, uh, e yen, which is kind of interesting given that also last week, Singapore and China and also France were doing interoperability in terms of being able to send that money out. So if we, you know, I'm not sure how many of you uh, know much about blockchain. So I'm gonna go very quickly over this because guess what? I've worked in technology but I'm not a technologist, though the technologists uh, agree, but the business people think I'm a technologist. So this is really about how to get in between. So blockchain, I've heard it called anything from spreadsheets in the sky, in the cloud, to really what it is, is a number of non-related uh, application that are able to work together. And when I mean application is a version of the information is held by many other participants. And through that, they are able to share information to one another. So the, the, the distribution of this database is on each device or on each cloud computer, or you can, and these are called nodes. So one of the, so actually in the cloud database, so this is really a comparison, sorry. So in the cloud, the database is centrally um, managed. So I'm a company and I manage this and information has been written and I am in control. Versus in the blockchain, a copy of the database is on each device or on each cloud or on each uh, node and basically there is cross verification. So if a record is in one and I need to transfer to another one and, and to another party, they can see it. In the cloud database, records can be modified or deleted. In blockchain, you must use cryptography, which are um, 
special keys, which usually will have a private and public key to make any changes. And there is a validation process. If the validation fails, it doesn't happen. And then finally, this whole idea of traceability. So technically in a cloud database, you shouldn't have any modification. But as we know, if I want to erase something, the history can be moved or deleted or disappear versus in blockchain, they are stored as a package and that package can be traced and no one can actually make any modification to it unless we all agree. So the truth of the moment is truth. And if we agree to make a change, we all agree to make a change and not just one person driving that change. Now, this is a diagram so you can see a bit of the clock complexity in terms of the value, the, the whole idea of why it's called blockchain. It's basically writing things into blocks. So you have an original block, then there's an exchange that goes on, then there is no information and a new block ID is given, and then you go and so on. Now, this is what you will see in the BTC blockchain or many of the other um, sort of like Ethereum. And I would even suggest things like Cardano are using this idea of blockchain called distributed ledger technology. And to me, the blockchain is a form of distributed ledger technology because in the distributed ledger technology, the information is not written much in blocks, but is interconnected through a common ID, and you don't see the stream in the same way. Uh, more than happy to provide more information, and also after uh, the call, I will provide some links to sites which are really great, uh, a couple of GitHub sites that you can also go and get more information, more familiarized with um, the whole blockchain space. Now, in terms of immutability, Again, in this diagram, what we're trying to show is that you have the original block, you can start create, you can make a change into the second aspect and then move to, so you have one, then you go to two, then you go to three, and you go back to, to the number one and have a new generation based on new data. So you can always add new data but you do not forget the data that had been put in before. Now, all of this, and my view is what makes the world go around is money. So we always talk in technology about killer apps. And I think cryptocurrency is the killer app of this distributed ledger technology. So using cryptography and using this concept of being able to add additional information instead of um, basically erasing or because we're so also agreeing, this, this person um, by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto, um, you know, there, there are t-shirts out there that says uh, Satoshi is female. We do, I, I think it must be, and that's my bias because she has not come out and, uh, and, and pumped her chest to say she's created this great thing. But that's my joke aside. But in reality, what that has done is it created this thing called Bitcoin, which is really uh, an asset that can be used as a form of currency. And it is basically being used to track who has uh, access, who, who owns the information. And it is a new form of distribution. In the same way, when I was talking about that big rock being an asset, you now have something which is much more portable, is actually in this digital wallet. So it's everything digital, but it also keeps track of who's had it, allows for fractionalization, and also uh, uses cryptography to actually let itself be distributed. Now, this has led to a new thing. And uh, unless you've been on the rock, you've 
probably all been hearing about the NFTs, so which stand for non-fungible token. So the difference between the non-fungible token and the average cryptocurrency is really about using the blockchain for creating an asset itself, which has only one value. It's, it cannot be morphed into something else. They are opportunities for actually creating a secondary NFT where you can then have fractionalization, but it allows you to add an asset such as a Mona Lisa, a picture of Mona Lisa. Maybe you give her a pipe, maybe you give her a mustache or you give her an Afro, but you basically can now take that asset, put it in a blockchain and have an ownership and creator on that and allow this asset to be transferred uh, among various um, uh, individuals. And one of the reasons that this is taking on like wildfire is if you think about um, creatives, if they do a piece of art or they do a, a, a piece uh, of music or uh, a poem, they do not have the ability to demonstrate their copyright. With NFT, they can do that now. So it allows not only them being able to track it, but also to be able to have dragon rights. So dragon rights is where if I sell it to Meta, Meta sells it to someone else, I get 5% of whatever she gets. And we continue this and I always in perpetuate, I'm seen as the ultimate owner. As you can imagine, this is absolutely new. Uh, it's creating a lot of uproar. And uh, actually this week it was announced that uh, Anthony Hopkins is coming out with a new movie and it will be issued as an NFT. Uh, we had last week Andrew Murray, um, Andrew Murray which is the, the uh, tennis player. He also issued an NFT and with his NFT, you were able to get video of his first win and not only that, you got to have a 30 minute lesson with him and uh, tickets to Wimbledon. Not a bad way to be able to get bragging rights as they say. So now if we take from NFT, the next progression is this whole idea of central bank digital currency. And now you actually get regulated by a central authority you do get unique. It can be scarce because um, as the government does normally with the printing, they can uh, limit how many are in circulation. And you can either carry it as cash or um, in digital in your crypto wallet. And now one of the things that ideally it will be able to do, and I don't think it's there, and this is why there is so much work happening uh, Singapore actually this week, and this might be something of interest, uh, at the end of the week, there is a, an open challenge to actually create certain solution around CBDC. And one of the big things is access. Obviously, we need to be able to transfer that money without having to have internet. And the anonymity, I think, is very important still because one of the big things about cash is our ability to transfer cash to someone without having prying eyes. So those are things that hopefully can be done using this whole NFT currency, which is CBDC. So um, as I said, money can be stolen. But one of the great things about the blockchain is that it cannot be hacked. Uh, when we hear about hacking that has been happening in the space, it's mostly due to um, exchanges not being uh, secure, uh, people not, have, not having their wallet be secure, but no actual blockchain technology has been breached at this time. So that means that instead of actually having all this printing that's going on, and this is an argument that has been uh, happening of late, which is that blockchain technology is not green and it takes a lot of electricity. 
and uh, you know the resources and all that environmental. But we forget that cash is actually very resource intensive. You need to have cotton, you need to have the printing, you need to have the ink, and you also need to transport it. So now there is actually the ability for banks to, instead of getting cash um, that they put in cages. And I remember about five years ago, I went up to Manchester into the uh, RBS um, uh, warehouse for cash. And it's crazy, you know, I mean, it, it was probably about six football fields wide and it was just cash inside and a lot, a lot of security. Like you had to actually leave your cell phone when you came in. So obviously I couldn't take pictures. I just have memories of all that money in the room. But now imagine you can do that on the blockchain and where the blocks represent the monetary unit and also the distribution of those blocks can be done much easily. So now what happens is that there, um, I'm, I'm guessing many of you would have heard of late of uh, about a, two years ago, Facebook announced that they were going to have a digital currency. Um, they kind of hinted that it would be blockchain related, but every regulatory body in the world project. There were over 50 companies, everything from Visa and MasterCard all the way to Mercy, which is a um, charity. So they were really looking at how to make this part of daily life. That didn't go so well for them. But as I mentioned before, over 180 um, countries are actually looking at uh, CBDC. And it's this idea, if you think of a CBDC, it's almost like an NFT using blockchain. Now, I should be very uh, transparent to say not everybody believes that it needs to use a blockchain. And those who are saying it doesn't need to use a blockchain are central bank, like the Central Bank of Jamaica. Uh, however, everybody else is using a blockchain to be able to create a ledger. And now, one of the challenges is that mostly with the China one, because there's two types, I should say, there's two types of CBDC, CBDC. There's going to be what we call retail, which is where individual, us as individual are getting the money. And if you think about it, it's going to be money, which is backed by the central bank. And it's gonna be tied to our uh, identity and it's going to most likely be local currency. We will still have the exchange aspect, but the, just the exchange, and this is what France and Singapore and China are working on, to be able to make where the exchange is almost instantaneous. Because if you guys know anything about foreign exchange, it's two to three days before you get your money, because there is a triangulation that needs to happen. It needs to go into the country of origin or an account that is in that. Look at the FX fluctuation, and then actually credit the money, which is what um, blockchain Bitcoin took away because you didn't need to wait. Once the transfer is out, nobody can stop it. Now, obviously with CBDC, because of the regulation and the fiscal, um, the fiscal outlook that will be done, there will be a tie-in to how the economy is doing versus cryptocurrencies, which are really based on how people feel. Now, why would we have CBDC? So the first thing is liquidity. It allows for you to have, for countries to have a better control of the liquidity. It allows for the paying of benefits of subsidies. Uh, uh, subsidies. Um, it's anti-fraud and money laundering because you can't, you know, you, you can't create your own blockchain to have that. You can have better fiscal uh, and civil um, um, civ uh, taxation can be done. And you can now see where the tax money is going and actually see that the changes that need to be done are taking place. So that's why country would want to be looking at CBDC. And most of it also, there is less uh, 
money being spent on actually printing uh, the coins and distributing them and making sure that you have the security that is necessary for that. Now, with every benefit, you get risk. And to me, these are things that we really need to make sure are there. And this is why we need to have many more of us in the space, because we risk civil liberties being, um, um, being affected, privacy. With CBDC, the big challenge is that the first is C, centralization. It's still centralized uh, mechanism of money. So can that succumb to bad actors? In many countries, no, because we have the right level of, um, of democratic system and uh, to be able to do that. But in many of the countries which are actually quickly adopting it, which is in the in the African continent and in the Caribbean, those have very volatile um, governments. And you could see where decentralization would lead to civil liberties being done. And then finally also, this whole idea of uh, creating siege. Uh, you could actually um, block people from being able to have access to the money that was in their wallet. And finally, is the technology dependency, more than technology, I would even say the infrastructure, you need to have electricity, you need to make sure you have the right security because you don't want to make, you know, even though we say, um, people then, believe me, there are people spending every day trying to figure out how they can break it. So we have to, there is a lot of investment that needs to continue in there. So um, in my point of view, the banks will not go away. They still need to be around because they're going to need to be distributing this. And uh, they will, however, need to make a lot of changes. And this is where I believe there is a lot of opportunity for, uh, for new people in the space because it's not just about blockchain. It is really uh, how do you make sure the wallets, how do you create um, the mechanism to keep somebody from losing their money. And also you can no longer have where you can't, you know, you do something and suddenly that money appears. We all know it doesn't grow on tree. So we will then be having to figure out how we tie it in to one person. And for many of those countries, that means that they are going to be the debtor of record to the population. Right now, they don't do that. They do that through the banks instead. Now, um, I just wanted to take you through the exciting stuff that's happening in terms of finance, but it's not just finance. We have, XRP, which is Ripple. So uh, you guys probably have been reading a lot about Ripples and Ripple was started based on the Bitcoin. It's an offshoot of Bitcoin blockchain. And it basically uses this mechanism to do a ledger between the banks. And uh, there has been certain, um, they've been fighting for lack of a better word with the FCC because they're saying we are not a, um, a security, we are basically a means of exchange. Also, you have other companies like Circle. Uh, one of the big things happening in the space is what are ex obviously exchanges, but decentralized exchanges are coming to, to, to play. And one of them is exchange. The other one is very much in, re uh, in real estate. I think real estate to me, appears to be one of those, um, those places where uh, blockchain makes a lot of sense in terms of access, but fundamentally it's the liquidity of that asset that comes in. So it's a much more of a long-term play. Uh, you, you probably have also heard in, um, in supply chain, Maersk has done a big project, which uh, they have over 150 uh, transportation companies, shipping companies participating. You also have Steam, which is similar to Reddit. And with Steam, um, participants are rewarded for posting. And then the whole aspect of Diamond, which is traceability of Diamond and value and insurance, which was started by Everledger. 
And there has also been the De Beers tracer, which is an application that has come out. Now, um, I wanted to take you through what I'm actually doing. So as I mentioned, um, I have a project called AgriLedger. And AgriLedger is on the island of Haiti. As you can see, very beautiful sea and lots of history. This is actually an actual castle, which was built in 1804, uh, after, no, 1840, after Haiti um, got rid of the French as the um, occupation by the French. Uh, unfortunately, Haiti has been of late in the news because of the demise of the president. But at one point, Haiti supplied over 50% of all the sugar, global sugar and also global coffee and global cocoa. Today, according to the FAO, even though Haiti produces about $1.4 billion worth of food, only 25 million is being exported. And unfortunately, 1.2 billion is also being imported. So access to food and uh, food security is really getting worse, mostly because of political instability. And obviously what comes with that is devaluation of the currency. So what we did in Haiti is uh, we did a project in Mango and there were about 1400 farmers. And this was about currency. The farmers, instead of selling to a middleman or to an exporter, were retaining their um, ownership of the goods. And with that, actually selling it directly to the foreign market, to the first level of the foreign market, which is the buyer. With this, they went from what was an average about 90 cents um, a box for a dozen of mango to where it was 750 per mango uh, per dozen. And that meant that their income went from 14 cents a kg to about a dollar 86. So it was an increase of over 750% in terms of the value that they pulled out from the cash. Now, um, Obviously, uh, one of the challenges that we have seen in Haiti, because we don't use cryptocurrencies in between for uh, the, the transfer of value, we use cash, mobile money, or wire. The challenges are that when it's wire or mobile money, unless the mobile money is uh, using like M-Pesa, and I don't know if some of you have heard of M-Pesa, which was in Kenya, so most 10 years ago, it allows anybody to transfer value to one another um, in small amounts. And it's using your mobile money, your mobile number, very much like in India, I believe is, uh, M oh God, TMPay or something, I, I, I forget, but India also has a lot of that, but a lot of countries have not gotten to, to that level. So which means CBDC becomes really a possibility. And if you're using it, the blockchain, the supply chain, the value chain to track the goods, you could actually start looking at this as a mechanism to pay subsidies and taxes to government and through the smart contract having those valuations. So if there is no successful sale, there's no tax. If there's a successful sale, there is a withholding which is done and paid to the state. You can even have it to where the withholding is done but not paid until an agreed upon time because if you have, in many of those countries, part of the problem is that if you pay your taxes, you never get a refund, it's gone, you get a credit. So this would allow for us in Haiti is easier ways of transferring payments to the farmers and to people in remote areas because then you don't have to have a truck of cash. And finally, I think that in reality, you can start lowering the cost of international trade and also the costs, which is because when we talk about the exchange of, of the foreign exchange, foreign exchange requires several parties in there, which means there is a payment being done to all those parties. So this would be a very good way of actually limiting uh, the cost and really making sure that more of the 
value is being delivered to the producers, not just only to farmers. So you can start seeing this in manufacturing also. So that is my presentation and I am very happy to take any questions and thank you for listening. And uh, thank you to Upgrad for having me and giving me an opportunity to speak to you, to you guys today. Thank you so much, Genevieve, for beautifully taking us through the endless possibilities uh, this whole technology has for us and for very beautifully covering what you have done with this amazing technology as well. And uh, I'd like the audience to ask some questions. I think I can see Nitesh answering his own question there. Uh, no, with the form of CBDC. So CBDC is not crypto-based. It's actually cent central oh. bank digital currency. <laughs> oh. So, uh, yeah. yes. Uh, okay. I, let's see at the chat if there's any other question. Uh, so Nitesh answered. Uh, uh, I think there's one question from Manoj uh, okay. about blockchain technology needs does it need any programming language? Which one is the best for this field? I, well, it's not, uh, in terms of programming languages, I think that uh, you will find, you have things like Solidity, which is for um, the bit, sorry, which is being used very much in Ethereum. Um, the Java, and JavaScript also. But what I'm hearing is becoming very important is Python because Python not only gives you the language that you can use for writing the code, but also a lot of relevant information in AI. Absolutely. I hope uh, you have your answer there, Manoj. Any other questions while while we get more questions on the board? I'd like to thank all the participants for so patiently listening to the session, and we look forward to answering some more of your questions in the next fifteen minutes uh, that Genevieve is here to tell you more about Upgrad. We offer programs in a variety of fields and verticals across software development, data science, machine learning product management, digital marketing, and MBA. We work with, we partner with universities to help working professionals upskill themselves and to transition and to accelerate their careers and achieve their career goals a lot faster with, with having the right education in place. All of the, all of the programs that we offer are, even though, partnering with university, we have industry experts of the likes of Genevieve coming in and talking to you about the industrial applications of the particular concept that you're, that you're learning. These, these sessions typically happen on the weekends uh, once you are a part of the program. You can visit upgrad.com to figure out if any program suits your career needs the best. And you will get a chance to learn with enrolled learners from 85 plus countries and uh, that in itself is going to be a great learning experience so um thank you so there is um tanme uh nuwakia ask as mentioned a transaction made in blockchain cannot be stopped so what if a transfer is made on a non-existing unique id I'm not sure that you would be able to, and this is where I was talking about, um, there is going to be a consensus model, uh, be it um, proof of work, proof of, you know, whichever proof there is going to be. So you would not be able to do it on a non-existing unique ID and it would fail the transaction. Uh, Niraj had uh, a question which says, use of blockchain, question, question mark. Could you, uh, elaborate um, what you you mean, and then also there's someone who says how many tools in the blockchain technology. Ooh, that it, it's not so blockchain technology. As I explained at the beginning, think of it like a database, and then from there, it's a unique database in that 
it allows for collaboration. Uh, and also it allows people who may be in competition with one another to actually uh, be able to exchange information without having to worry that that information can be, um, can be manipulated by someone else. So in the Haiti context, uh, I'll use as an example, when the farmer brings in, let's say a thousand mangoes, no one can change that from the fact that he bought in a thousand mango. If it's agreed at the time of delivery, that's a thousand, it always will be a thousand. Now things can happen in between that some are lost and you can track that information. But again, it can never go from a thousand to being 500 without having explanation. So I hope um, that kind of uh, gives a, a view. Um, let's see. So Wendy's question is, how will you use blockchain to further improve Haiti? So uh, in Haiti, what we did with the government and the World Bank project was uh, fresh fruits. And right now we are talking uh, to the exporters about the coffee and cocoa trade, but we're also looking at places in Africa and in Asia for the sugar industry. Uh, at this point, I think that mostly in agriculture, we are concentrating on those commodities, which are very valuable, or also can be um, where, where people will try. So that allows us to get more familiar. I was speaking to someone this morning and they said, is the consumer aware chain? And my answer is most likely not. We're not there yet. We don't understand what's happening behind it and we are not privy. If you happen to live in the US, you probably have heard about the project with IBM and Walmart. But as an individual, you, it's not ubiquitous that where everything, everywhere you step, you're able to see that. And even in Walmart, it's only the vegetables and the fruits, but that information is not imparted to, uh, to the consumer. What we want to do with AgriLedger is have that connectivity of your food to, from the consumer back to the producer, because unfortunately many children today, if you ask them, where does your carrot come from? They'll tell you from the supermarket. And that's something that is problematic. So we need to be able to reconnect and also we need to make sure that people who are in that space are getting an equitable and fair distribution of the money that is being made. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask a follow-up question. Does it also help in the entire supply chain? Uh, the, because so what, the cost can happen even during say warehousing, right? Yeah, exactly. And this is, so usually the hard part is to get the, the community or the crowd to participate. So what we have done is we have shown to the crowd that there is value for them. The next level is where we're now uh, concentrating in, in for AgriLedger is working with brands and manufacturers for them to be able to take that information so that they understand from the, the farm to the um, storage what has happened uh, or if there are any phytosanitary testing which is happening on the line or in a room what is that tied in and if that would mean that if there is a problem if there is uh, any kind of bacteria or e coli that it, it doesn't reach the customer because unfortunately we seem to have more these challenges where people are dying and that's when we realize oh there's a problem with this batch and we try to call it back um so it's it, it is a process of uh so obviously it works well when you have government involved because it gives trust and assurance to people that there is someone which is making sure let's say for the producers making sure that somebody is looking after their um their well-being, but I think that as time goes by and because of all the 
news that has come out around the blockchain, uh, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum, that more people are aware of this technology now. So therefore you start thinking about what can, can be done. Now I saw that uh, uh, Kachana asked a question about software development jobs in India. Um, I'm guessing it's in India, but for me, actually my, my um, development is actually happening in India. It's right now in Bangalore and we're about to move it to Kochi. So there are lots of opportunity. And I think the opportunity are not just in blockchain because once you have that data, you need to understand where the data is coming and how that data is written to then be able to have effective uh, reporting and visualization. So. There is a lot right now in terms of visualization and reporting that we see in what I would say are the, I don't want to say run of the mill, the accepted uh, application that are out there. But what is definitely needed is people to come in and have those skill set in machine learning and in um, also in uh, AI to then start creating the intelligence that is necessary because if we see certain patterns so one of the things um, like let's say companies like uh, Volkswagen is actually using a blockchain solution and the purpose that they're doing it is to track the parts genuine parts because I don't know if you know about this but if you go and you have your car service and the part that is put in is not an, a genuine Manufacturer, your warranty becomes invalidated. So, which means you now anything that breaks down, you're accountable for in your car. So, as a result, what they have done is they've started issuing numbers for their parts. So, if you go to the mechanic, there is on the blockchain a verification process to make sure that is the right part. So, there there are. So, I wouldn't look at the technology just as a technology, but also I'm expecting in the next year and, and two years, a really a busting out in terms of big organization doing blockchain technology and it's beyond the banks. It's go and the other piece is that once we start seeing more CBDC, think about it, corporations are going to need to figure out how do they get it on their books? How do they pay their people? And all those changes, it's gonna be kind of like uh, 1999 again, where we're getting ready for 2000 and we need a lot of changes to the technology. Absolutely. Thanks for covering so many different aspects and, and uh, some of the questions that uh, we had also got in the chat box, I guess, was about the different applications. So Genevieve just pointed out one in the auto sector, right? Uh, Sophie's question is what areas do you see NFTs expanding into? Right now, it's expanding. Uh, so I, I know several projects, some I've been involved in. Uh, the first one that was really big was this idea of art and um, digital art being used. So we had the Beepo, which was a 60 million uh, art cell, which happened. You've also had the Banksy, which where the digital version was the one which survived and people burned the physical copy. Now we're starting to see things like Katy Perry uh, issuing NFT for her merchandise. Where that is very interesting is because what you have is this online world, the metaverse. So now you can imagine you have something which is a digital representation. Let's say your t-shirt that you bought with Katy Perry and you go into the metaverse and you're showing to your friends your t-shirt. Uh, as I mentioned, Anthony Hopkins also is coming to this movie called Net Zero, <laughs> which is going to be on an NFT. Uh, I'm speaking to an organization which is looking at music in NFT. Now, one of the challenges of NFT is copyright. So if I sell you my NFT, what am I actually bestowing on you? Is it like a book where you have a book that you can enjoy and read? you don't have the right to take pages of my book and publish them to make money yourself. That's not what you bought when you bought the book. 
So that's, those are some of the things that you're coming up with the NFT. And because it's kind of the wild, wild west right now, people are infringing on uh, copyrights. And so I see a secondary uh, market, which is going to be the infringement police, people going and saying, you owe me money or take this down. And that has been happening in places like even uh, comic, because when somebody actually designs for some of those comics books, you don't actually have the rights to the digital copy of that comic. And it used to be with Comic-Con, you could go and you hand, uh, draw it and you could sell it to someone. Now there's an issue. These guys want to put a digital copy uh, as an NFT and that violates the copyrights of the character that they sold to, um, to, to, to the comic company. So we're going to see a lot of um, action in also being able to forensically. So creation is going to be one, but there's going to be a lot of uh, blockchain necessary to figure out who's infringing on, on the rights of others. Well, that example also makes me think of the applications of the creative industry that is in for blockchain as well, right? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I think two questions. Um, Abhi's question is, can we use cryptology concept in machine learning? And Vinay's question is, how Solana's proof of history works? Any um, any light you can throw on that? I don't know anything. I apologize. I don't know anything about Solana uh, at this point. And so I guess the proof of history must be that somehow um, you're going back and a fancy way of calling it proof of stake or proof proof of work because proof of work is proof of having actually completed so is this you know so unfortunately there is a lot of buzzes that comes in in the blockchain uh, dlt space because everybody's looking to get attention uh, someone says, I want to develop an application using blockchain. Which tool should I use or study? So I think this is a great place to start in being able to understand. Um, if you want to start, like, let's say, um, I, there are courses which are offered uh, by the likes of uh, uh, Consensus Academy. I'm not sure if Upgrad has actual training in blockchain uh, tech in technology. Yeah, we, you yeah, do? We, yeah, we do. We have an advanced certificate certification program and even um, a master's in computer science with a specialization in blockchain that you can look at. So that could be one area to begin. Uh, and uh, Another thing I think you can do is uh, maybe listen to yesterday's session we had and maybe you'll get some ideas there. So you can write to us at admissions at Upgrad and get us for a recording for yesterday's session. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we'll pick up the last question, Genevieve, uh, just given the time bound that we are at. And uh, just asking uh, the audience who stayed with us uh, throughout the session on how they found the session and would they like to attend uh, future sessions with us. So Tanmay's question is, considering CBDCs being the future of currency, how would uh, poverty be a factor affecting it? Uh, actually, um, I think that illiteracy, if we mean by illiteracy, not being able to read or write, I actually have a challenge with, uh, with that in that I believe that um, that ability does not keep you from being able to count or being able to actually remember what's, you know, you know what a one looks like. So people being illiterate does not affect their ability to understand the value of money. I think the bigger issue is going to be the digital illiteracy which many of us, even when well-educated, can suffer from. Uh, and this is where the challenges uh, I have for CBDC, in which is more the digital literacy and also getting everybody to agree. Because one of the places uh, we talked about Kenya, which is with the M-Pesa, M-Pesa uses um, 
this digital currency and I was able to buy a shawl in the middle of the bush. The guy had a cell phone and I asked him for his phone and I transferred money to him. So this is what needs, it's the trust and the fact that you can actually look and see, because you can tell what 10 is and you can tell what 100 is without having to learn, been gone to school to learn. So I think that the bigger challenge is really going to be one, this misconception that we have that literacy equals uh, knowledge. It's more, how do we assure that people have access to internet? How do they have access to electricity? and through those, then making sure that they have access to food and water. Absolutely. Okay, that brings us to the end of the Q&A. Thanks, Genevieve, for sufficiently answering each of the questions asked. And uh, thank you all for asking such brilliant questions. And if there's anything that has been left out, do feel free to write to us at admissions at .com and we'll ensure we answer your queries. And Look forward to having you with us for another Insights with Upgrad session. And Genevieve, look forward to having another interesting session with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good night. <laughs>